On this episode of China Unscripted, America is facing off with China, and Taiwan could be the next battlefront. Is war with China inevitable? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Ian Easton, Senior Director of Project 49 Institute and author of The Chinese Invasion Threat. Ian, thanks for joining us again. Chris, it is my great pleasure. So it's October 2020. We've talked before about how the PLA needs to be ready to invade Taiwan by the end of 2020. Can the People's Liberation Army still pull it off? Uh, no, happily they cannot. Their window to invade Taiwan this year has closed uh, due to the weather. Um, and so Taiwan is safe from invasion for at least the next five or six months. Well, I'm almost sorry to will... hear that because I remember reading in a really interesting book about how it would definitely happen by 2020. He didn't say that. Are you sure that book said it would definitely happen? I don't remember any predictions being made. <laughs> well, whatever the facts may or may not be, answer the question, Ian. Don't throw this back on me. <laughs> Let's ask Shelly. Shelly, do you think that China is going to invade Taiwan this year? I'm going to listen to the experts, which oh, I answer. mean is you. So if you say no... I'm going to listen to you. But if you're wrong, then we're both out of luck. Well, so why is it impossible to happen this year? There's still a couple months left in 2020, I'm sorry to say. Well, certainly China could attack Taiwan this year. They could they could really do a lot of unpleasant things. I mean, really, the options open to them are limited only by the bounds of sinister imagination. I mean, the Chinese Communist Party is full of wickedly smart people, uh, even diabolically smart people. And there's a lot of things they could do to make the current tensions, which are very high, and they've continued to escalate this entire year, really since January, uh, they could make that much worse. But they couldn't physically invade Taiwan this year. It's not militarily feasible. For an invasion to be feasible, they would have had to have mobilized in a massive way last month in September, and they have not done that. Uh, and they would have had to have started uh, bombarding uh, Taiwan, not just with missiles, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and cyber attacks, uh, but also with uh, acts of sabotage, assassination attempts, things of that nature that we can expect from their doctrinal writings that they're going to do before they invade. Uh, none of that has happened happily. Uh, so deterrence has held to this point. Uh, but the, the question is whether it will continue to hold into 2021. And of course, nobody can say with any certainty that it will. The reason the September, uh, October timeframe is important is because uh, it takes a lot of time to move hundreds of thousands of troops across the Taiwan Strait. And by the end of October, the sea conditions, so the, the waves, uh, the winds in the Taiwan Strait become really brutal. Uh, and in fact, if you visit, uh, for example, the Penghu Islands in the middle of the, of the Taiwan Strait come Thanksgiving time, it's hard to sleep at night. And, and I know because I've, I've been along the coast that time of year and the wind screams. It's really creepy. It actually screams and you, you can see your door trying to open itself. It's really powerful. Uh, and of course, that affects the sea states uh, and that makes any amphibious operation physically impossible uh, that time of year. Uh, but again, there's a lot of other things that they could do to continue to ratchet up tensions between now and the middle of next March, which according to the PLA's own studies is when the conditions would improve. They do every year. Uh, the, the, the weather here has been studied by Chinese military planners for literally seven decades. Um, and they watch it every year. And so the next window for an, an actual physical amphibious invasion will be next March or April. Of course, I don't expect that to happen, um, but that would become physically possible, militarily feasible um, at that time. It's not anymore. And so that, that's happy news of a solo. So there's another six months at least. But you're saying that they could attack Taiwan in some way, but they just couldn't invade it fully. 
Right. So they they could do anything other than invasion. They could put guys in helicopters. They could uh, infiltrate Taiwan with special operations forces. There's a lot of other things that they could do, but they couldn't actually move an army of hundreds of thousands of men across the Taiwan Strait until next until the next window uh, opens, until the weather clears, and, and that'll be next year. I thought I would feel better about that, but I'm not sure I do. <laughs> I mean, 2020 has been a pretty rough year for other reasons, so. At least we don't have an invasion of Taiwan this year. Exactly. The, the one bright spot of 2020. But it seems like we shouldn't cross out attack Taiwan yeah. on our bingo cards. Good point. But Ian, don't you think it's possible that a single lone wolf warrior, a knife clutched between his teeth, could swim across the strait regardless of the weather? And single-handedly invade Taiwan? I mean, Chris, if he was as tough as you are, I bet he could at least make it to Jinmen. You're my favorite guest. Lord... <laughs> Maybe not to Big Jinmen, but he could at least make it to Little Jinmen, swim through the mines, and make it ashore. And then if he had enough Red Bull, he could probably <laughs> cover and then do some damage. We have to stop the Red Bull exports or imports to China. It's the only thing keeping Taiwan safe. Oh, God. Wolf, Wolf Warrior 5. Ugh, yeah. <laughs> well, you were focused very much on uh, this this guarantee, this promise that you made that China would invade oh, stop, by 2020. Chris. What What changed? Well, nothing changed. Um, and certainly I did not promise uh, or predict that there would be an invasion this year. Actually, to be honest, when I look back on on the last three, four years now, I think I was probably overly optimistic. When you read uh, some of the things that I wrote, if you read uh, my book, The Chinese Invasion Threat, uh, that was based on a lot of internal PLA books uh, that were published in 2014, 2015, and they leaked out not too long after that. And I was able to use those as basis for doing some analysis on China's plans to invade Taiwan. And what I found is that their own assessments said that they were not ready, that they actually internally, they would never do this to an external audience because of, of the psychological uh, messaging campaign that they weighed, which always says that they're ready to invade Taiwan at any time and they could do it uh, at their leisure. With a lone That's wolf their, warrior. They could do it with a lone wolf warrior. They could do it with 1.4 billion people. They could do it at any time with any number of ways. That's their propaganda message. And the Chinese Communist Party, as you know, is very, very good at propaganda. The reality, though, is that they do have professional military strategists in their ranks, and they're very smart. And when they write their internal teaching materials, when they do their operational studies, they have to be honest, or at least they have to be much more honest uh, internally than they are externally. And what they said was that they were not ready to invade Taiwan. Well, as it turned out, that admission of weakness was both a blessing and a curse for the People's Liberation Army. It was a blessing because Xi Jinping got the memo, and he decided that he was going to completely revamp and bolster China's military to make them ready to invade Taiwan. And the goal that, that he set was the year 2020 for them to be ready to do it. Of course, he never committed to actually invading Taiwan this year. No good politician will make a commitment of that nature. Um, but that was, that was a blessing for the PLA because finally they had a leader that was committed to them, that saw the importance of the military and gave them a sense of mission what Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party also did was they invested in, a, I mean, they were already engaged in a massive military buildup before this time. Over the past five years, they have actually accelerated that in a really stunning fashion. And the reason it's a curse, in addition to being a blessing for the PLA, is that when Xi Jinping decided that he was going to reform and restructure the PLA, he did it in a very brutal fashion. 
he completely smashed the entire military to pieces. All of the the, the four general departments, uh, all all the way down to militia units, to people's armed police units, they were all smashed to pieces. Thousands and thousands of careers were ruined by the process. And in fact, over 100 general officers, so these are, are generals and admirals in the Navy, uh, they were arrested. They were arrested on corruption charges, but of course, the entire PLA is corrupt. And so what that really meant is they were arrested for noncompliance. And many of them were actually shot. Uh, in some cases, according to reports that have come out, they were shot in front of their peers because Xi Jinping wanted to send a message that he did intend to do this sweeping military reform and organization program. And the aim of that program, according to Xi Jinping's own words, was to create a joint military force that would be capable of fighting and winning any of China's envisioned future uh, wars. And of course, the one they focused the most heavily on, and the one that's the most stressful and the most difficult from their perspective, is the invasion and occupation of Taiwan, which could very well mean fighting a protracted great power war with the United States. And so for many in the PLA, they probably regret uh, doing the studies that they did uh, and being as honest as they were with Xi Jinping, because he actually has acted on it. And so we're, we're dealing with a very different Chinese military today than we were just a few years ago. You know, I know Xi Jinping has been appointing a lot of uh, high-ranking generals and officials in the PLA loyal to him. But from what you're saying, I, I wonder if at the end of the day, how the PLA actually feels about Xi Jinping, if they really are loyal to him. When push comes to shove, I mean, morale is very high when you know you're shooting all the senior officers. Yeah, and and that was actually a reason for some optimism uh, just a few years ago, that when analysts started to see, you know, people in, in Washington D.C., for example, that that study the Chinese military, when they started to see this sweeping military reform and reorganization program take place, when they saw those, you know. Thousands, literally thousands of, of high-ranking military officers, including some, in some cases, three-star generals, which is our equivalent of a four-star general, as high as you can go. Some of these guys being arrested and then suicided or actually shot in front of their peers. There was great optimism, I think, in Washington that that program would fail, that it would actually serve to weaken the People's Liberation Army. It would certainly devastate their morale, and I'm sure it did that. But what it's also seems to have done is it shocked everybody into this really subservient position that those that survived are terrified for their own lives and the, and the, the health and well-being of their families. And so they've all fallen into line. And everybody who hasn't fallen into line behind whatever Xi Jinping wants to do, because now he's, he's a full-on dictator in a way that China hasn't had since Mao Zedong, everybody who didn't go along has now been thrown into prison if you go in prison in China, you're tortured. Um, and so that's a, a really, really awful fate. Uh, and again, many of them were executed as well. And so now we're dealing with the Chinese military where there may be a lot of uh, hard feelings. There certainly are. There must be. But they will probably do anything that they're asked to do or they're directed to do by Xi Jinping. But if he truly, in his heart of hearts, has plans to invade and occupy Taiwan, and he certainly does, He's, I think he's been very clear about that in some of his public statements. If that's true, it's very difficult now to imagine him getting any good military advice. It's very difficult to imagine that any general or any military advisor, any civilian advisor, national security matters for that example, uh, for that matter, saying to Xi Jinping, sir, are, the odds of failure are still too high. You know, maybe it's a 50-50 shot. By the year 2025, maybe we should go then. 50 50 odds are, you know, those are gambling odds. And in war, that's probably about the best you can hope for. If they tried it today, and as I've said, they couldn't physically do it right now, uh, but say they did it in March or April next year, I think their odds of success are still quite small. But those odds are going to continue to increase every year going forward because they have engaged in this massive, really incredible military buildup. And I think seeing the results of five years of their military reform program has really forced a lot of people 
in the Pentagon and in other places in US government and other governments around the region to look at China's military really with new eyes. And the picture that they see is one that's actually very dark for the future. Well, I think it was definitely shocking that, you know, the Pentagon came out and said China's Navy is larger than the United States. They have missiles with a greater range than a lot of the United States missiles. But another thing that has changed is you've seen the United States giving a lot more support to Taiwan uh, militarily, uh, as well as... Why are you well, laughing, Shelley? We're, we're laughing because we just saw Ian drink from his mug, which... Uh, is one of the, oh. the China Uncensored mug that I guess we gave you a couple of years ago. Right? I missed that. You did. It was one of my very favorite Christmas gifts Oh, uh, two Christmases ago and, and really appreciate it. Shelly has told me that if I did this call today, that I might stand a chance of getting another one in the future. And, and I certainly hope that's the case because I love them. Well, we're struggling to find a uh, merchandise vendor who will work with us. But as soon as we can solve that, you bet. T-shirt you. would be okay too. Yeah. Uh, we're sure. struggling that's, with T-shirts that's a, too. That's another issue. Yeah, be uh, between finding a vendor that is not made in China, so you're already eliminating the majority, uh, and then among the rest of them, ones that are willing to work with us, uh, because and just it's a variety of things. But merch is very difficult. Like we're we're in the worst possible position to have merchandise. Well, anyways, back to my brilliant question. Yes, you had a brilliant question, uh, yeah. Chris. So, I mean, the U.S. is now aware of like how uh, how much more of a threat the Chinese military is than it was before. Uh, but you've also seen the United States offering more support to Taiwan than, than we've ever seen, uh, from bigger and better weapons sales to sending high-level U.S. officials there, like Mark Esper. And no, uh, Alex, no, Azar. Azar. Alex Azar. Is the, Esper is the defense secretary. I thought defense that's what you were going to go because of the whole Battle Force 2045 thing. Yes. That's why oh, I said Battle Esper. Force 25. Yeah, that's why, Mark Esper. Yeah, sorry. I have uh, recently decided to stop drinking coffee. And... <laughs> oh, is that what happened? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so so that's that's a mistake, Chris. <laughs> Evidently. Should Back we... to you, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Mark Esper, Secretary of Defense, did visit Taiwan, that would be a really, really big deal. Unfortunately, in spite of a lot of the positive things that we've seen from uh, the Trump administration, they have not gone that far. And there's still a lot of room for improvement. They've actually been very cautious. So there's been an increase in arms sales, uh, the types and the quality some of the things that has been sold to Taiwan, they've started to be more transparent about the uh, U.S. Navy destroyers, primarily destroyers that are transiting the Taiwan Strait. Of course, that was going on before. It was just that the U.S. government was doing that previously in an opaque fashion. Now they're publish, uh, publishing the, the details of it. They're even tweeting when they go through the Taiwan Strait and showing pictures of it. And I think there's there's a certain amount of deterrence value. Certainly, there's a, a political value in doing that. It's very, I think it's a, it's a very positive step. Uh, but we have not seen high level visits from the Defense Department. I think the highest level has been a one star, two star general, and I think a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense has gone, which is roughly the equivalent of a, a two star general. Uh, we've not seen anything. Um, above and beyond that. We have not yet seen Taiwan invited to the U.S. Navy's uh, multilateral military exercise in the Pacific, the big one that they do, the Rim of the Pacific exercises. They do that every two years in Hawaii. Unfortunately, Taiwan was not invited this year to attend, even as an observer. We still don't have troops in Taiwan, not even a small token force uh, of troops or Marines there to serve as a strategic trip line. And so there, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And what concerns me is I think there are a lot of folks who still believe that Taiwan can maintain deterrence on its own, that Taiwan can prevent an attack by China, and it could even win a war against China by itself, fight by itself. And the reason I, I don't think that is 
realistic is, first of all, you look at the tremendous latent war-making potential of the People's Republic of China. You look at their massive military buildup over the, the past five years, and then you can compare it what, with what the United States and what Taiwan and other democracies have done. It's very difficult to justify a massive ramp up in military spending in a democracy. Democracies typically don't vote that way. Certainly, they don't do that in peacetime. And of course, the United States is not, Taiwan is not. And so they've really not kept up with the, the threat as the threat picture has changed. And so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And the only way that deterrence is going to hold in the coming years, if, if it can hold at all, and that's an open question, is for the United States and Taiwan to stand shoulder to shoulder. Right now, they're not. You know, our two countries have been separated by a very large gulf, a political diplomatic gulf, uh, over the past 40 years, that we don't have uh, diplomatic relations with Taiwan. We don't have an embassy there. We have Actually, we have an embassy in all but name, we call it the American Institute in Taiwan, AIT, which is actually in, in real life, it's an embassy. Just nobody calls it that. Nobody's allowed to call it that. And that creates a lot of problems when you have this, this flourishing democratic country that you don't treat as a country. That means that you can't do all the types of things that we would normally do, and the, in fact, that, that our government does and our military does do with other countries and other militaries around the world to maintain deterrence, that we treat Taiwan completely different than we treat everybody else. And in many ways, Taiwan is considered, so it's treated as a pariah state, even though it's this flourishing democracy. And I think that that's all too... You know, that comes with the cost. It comes with a very real cost. And the cost is that you weaken deterrence. And so now there's this really rich debate that's going on about ending strategic ambiguity, which is the current policy that we have towards Taiwan, which says that no one knows if the United States is going to come to Taiwan's defense or not in the event of a Chinese invasion. And now there's a debate about the wisdom of that, that policy. And I think that that's a debate that is happening really not a moment too soon. Yeah, I think I've seen a lot of articles about the strategic ambiguity thing. When we interviewed Wang Dingyu, Taiwanese member of parliament, earlier this year in January, he mentioned RIMPAC and that the U.S. should invite Taiwan to RIMPAC. And he said something about how in Asia, the two countries that never have been invited are Taiwan and North Korea, something like that. And that was a very striking comparison. Uh, between t those two completely different states that are, like you said, Taiwan is a pariah state, but for a totally different reason than North Korea. Where do you stand on the strategic ambiguity thing? Do you think that we should spell it out? Well, I think it's, it's true that Taiwan, in some ways, does get treated like North Korea. In fact, you know, depending on how you look at it, North Korea gets better treatment than, than Taiwan. So here we have one of the worst dictatorships on the planet, the Stalin, Stalinistic, uh, really brutal, really awful dictatorship, which is threatening us with nuclear weapons and threatening our allies with nuclear weapons. Well, we actually treat them better in ta than Taiwan. We're willing to have our president meet with their leader, the chairman Kim Jong-un, show our flag, the, United, the flag of the United States of America, right alongside the flag of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. We're willing to have official talks with them. Our Secretary of State has actually been to North Korea. I think President Trump actually stepped in, in North Korean territory at Panmunjom uh, very briefly. You haven't seen any of that when it comes to Taiwan. You'll never see the President of the United States, at least we haven't seen it yet. I, I hope that we'll see this in the future with the President of the United States actually acknowledging Taiwan's existence as a legitimate, sovereign, independent country. Because, of course, Taiwan has exercised legitimacy and sovereignty over its own territory for 70 years. Since Chiang Kai-shek moved his forces uh, and his government, the Republic of China government, to Taipei in December of 1949, from that point on, the United States recognized Taiwan. We moved our embassy to China from the mainland of China, from Nanjing to, to Taipei, right up until 1979. We had a lot of troops. We had thousands of troops in country. 
We had four destroyers that were based on Taiwan. We had constant patrols in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, there was so much we did. We supported uh, Taiwan at the United Nations up until the early 1970s. We completely built Taiwan from a military dictatorship under Chiang Kai-shek and the, and the KMT into this flourishing democracy that we have today. It was one of the greatest uh, outcomes, one of the greatest successes uh, in terms of diplomacy of the Cold War. That also happened with South Korea as well, where we were allied with a military dictator. And then in the late 1980s, they started to reform almost the exact same time as Taiwan did. But the tragedy of this particular case, the case of Taiwan, is that we treated Taiwan differently than we treated South Korea. We treated Taiwan differently than we treated uh, West Germany uh, or even South Vietnam. Uh, in the case of Taiwan, again, the Republic of China government, we bought into this false narrative which is patently false. I mean, it's objectively false that there is only one China uh, in the world and we have to recognize one or the other. In fact, since 1949 on, there have been two countries that have China in their name, the People's Republic of China, communist dictatorship, and the Republic of China, which was a military dictatorship. And then in the last two, two plus decades has evolved into this great democracy and unfortunately, after 1979, as you guys know very well, we moved our embassy uh, out of Taipei. We opened a new embassy in Beijing almost overnight. We derecognized Taiwan, and we started to treat Taiwan as a pariah state. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sure that that made good strategic sense at the time. That there were there was the the pressing realities of the Cold War. There was a sense in the late 1970s that we were starting to lose the Cold War, that the conventional military balance in along the central front in Europe was shifting. NATO was not only outgunned and outnumbered at the conventional level of warfare, but also starting at the nuclear level of warfare. And so I think there was certain uh, impulse in uh, strategic circles in the United States government that said, we have to do something different than we have been. We have to do something big. And if we can win over the People's Republic of China, we can win them to our side, we can put pressure on the Soviet Union, on their, their weak southern flank. And that's what we did. And it made good strategic sense at the time. But unfortunately, after the Cold War ended in 1991, and after the Tiananmen Square massacre, we did not have a fundamental look at our China policy and at our Taiwan policy. And there was, to my knowledge, there was no, there was no rethink of why in this new world, this post-Cold War world, we would continue to treat Taiwan as a pariah state. And so here we are now in the year 2020, and we still continue to act like it's the late 1970s, or at least we, we continue to act on the basis of decisions that were made at a very different time in our history. I mean, but what would happen if, for example, the United States invited the Taiwanese military to join the RIMPAC exercises in Hawaii. Like, it sounds like, oh, we could just invite them, but there would be some kind of consequence from the People's Republic of China for that, right? There would be a consequence, uh, but there's also a consequence of not inviting them. And I think that's the question that doesn't get asked enough. We ought to ask ourselves all the time. Right now, people at the State Department and other places in the U.S. government they're always asking themselves, what will China do? What will China think if we do X, Y, or Z with Taiwan? They're terrified of that. They don't know the answer to that. There's no way to predict what the Chinese Communist Party is going to do. We have very poor intelligence on them. So nobody knows what they're going to do. They might lash out, or they might just do a demarche, uh, or they might start World War III. Uh, and there's no way to predict that. But it's the fear of the unknown that has caused us to overlook what I think is a much more important question. The more important question is, what will happen if we continue on the current path, if we continue to isolate Taiwan, if we continue to go out of our way to not do military exercises with the Taiwanese, to not have normal exchanges like we would do with any other democracy that faces an existential threat? That's the question. That's the question that doesn't get asked. And I think if people did ask that question, and of course I'm posing it now, the answer is obvious. That if we continue on the path that we are today, Taiwan will no longer exist 
at some point in the future. And it'll probably be in our lifetimes that what has happened in Xinjiang, what has happened in Tibet, what is now happening in Hong Kong uh, will happen to Taiwan, except in Taiwan's case, it'll be much worse because Taiwan can actually defend itself. There could be a major superpower war. Uh, and I think that's, unfortunately, I, I'm concerned that that's the direction we're heading, that China is engaged in this massive military buildup. The leader of China, uh, chairman of the People's Republic of China, of course, his, his actual title is not president. Nobody should ever call Xi Jinping president. If you, if you can read Chinese, as I know you guys can, his actual title is chairman of the state of the People's Republic of China, and of course, chairman of, or general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. He has gone on public record to say that he views the annexation of Taiwan as essential to his vision for China's future. That when he talks about the China dream, there is one and only one metric for success that that's actually measurable. You know, he talks about a rich country, a strong military, you know, middle class. Well, these are all things that, that can be left for interpretation. We could get to the year 2049 and the Chinese Communist Party can, they can, under any circumstance, they can say they achieve success according to those metrics. But there's one concrete metric of success that Xi Jinping has provided, and that is the annexation of Taiwan, what, what they euphemistically call uh, unification or reunification. That is the one and only objective measure we have, according to Xi Jinping, for whether or not the China dream has been fulfilled and whether or not the, the great rejuvenation or the resurgence of, of China has been accomplished. And so when you think about that, what he's saying is that the CCP's aims are fundamentally hostile. They're fundamentally expansionistic in nature that they're not reacting to external events, that there's this, I think it's a very popular narrative in mainstream media, and I think in, in the holes of, of power and government all around the world, there's this narrative that, well, China is just reacting. China's in a reactive position. And the reason that they have lashed out is because of the election results in Taipei, because of an arms sale sales notification to Congress, which has gone public as they do from time to time, uh, or it's because of a, a high level State Department visit, that, that there's always some reason for, there's always some trigger event for China to lash out. And so it creates this impression in people's minds that the Chinese leadership is, is really emotional and that they're actually really, they're, they're kind of hot with anger all the time and they'll lash out if we do anything with Taiwan. I don't think that's the case. I think if you actually analyze the published speeches of Xi Jinping, and you can go on YouTube and watch them, by the way, if you listen to what he actually says, and you read what he's actually written and what many of the other CCP elite have actually written about this issue, it, it's quite clear that they are cold and calculating, if, if anything, that they're not very emotional and they're not they're not prone to uh, actually acting out in anger, that they have a long-term vision for the future and that they're moving towards that in a step-by-step -step fashion. They've done that in Hong Kong. It shocked the entire world to, to see what they've done. Uh, and then their next target now is Taiwan. I think it's interesting that you suggest actually listening to what the Chinese leadership has said. Because I feel like for the last 20 years, you know, the Chinese military has been saying, and not just about Taiwan, but about other things like asymmetrical warfare and, uh, you know, and undermining, you know, the U.S. Like they've basically in white papers for decades, they've been saying like, here's what we're going to do. We consider ourselves at war with the United States. They've been saying this since 2000. Uh, and yet we've all kind of collectively pretended that they're not actually telling us that this is what they're doing, and yet they have been doing it. They've considered, you know, they've been at a trade war with the U.S. since they joined the WTO, uh, and it's only kind of been recognized since, you know, our current president has, you know, put tariffs on, and now people are like, oh, well, Trump launched a trade war, but really, China's been on the trade war for for decades, and so now 
we're seeing Chinese leadership say, we are going to invade Taiwan. We're telling you this is our plan uh, and we're building a military to do it. And yet we're just like, oh, but that couldn't happen. And if we sit tight and kind of keep our mouths shut and don't invite them to RIMPAC, then everything's going to be, you know, hunky dory. Yeah, it's, it's mirror imaging, right? We project our own Western, our own American sensibilities and thought processes on our adversary. We, we, we project our own values and our own principles and our own, our own logic, version of logic, onto a very, very different political organization. And, and we just assume that naturally they kind of see the world the way we do. And again, the remedy to that problem, which I think is widespread, is to actually learn Chinese and to learn not only Chinese, but to learn that kind of Orwellian uh, doublespeak that they use, that Marxist-Leninist, you know, bureaucratic garbage that they use when they give speeches, which is really painful to do. Mm-hmm. Their, their speeches are awful as far uh, as O's is concerned. Uh, but once you learn what their signature their hallmark mottos, their expressions, you know, those four character, eight character expressions that they use over and over and over again. Once you learn what they actually mean, and you can figure out how to translate that into plain, clear English, then I think it becomes a little more clear. The United States government has started to do a very good job of that. I mean, if you listen to the speeches that Secretary of State Pompeo has given recently, they're amazingly uh, clear, you know, has just I think nailed it. Uh, I've never seen any any leader, any politician do that. Certainly not. That has not happened in the past forty years. You know, we've had this outpouring of really level a clear-minded uh, strategic thought from from this administration. We've seen this with Vice President Pence, and so I think now there's a lot more clarity on this, and people are starting to 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 do mirror imaging less than before. And I think that's all, all to the good. And I think that's probably one of the reasons there's now this really good debate that's going on about our China policy and also about our Taiwan policy. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the Marxist-Leninist language, because I think, you know, even when Pompeo and Pence and uh, O'Brien, like all of these U.S. officials are coming out and spelling out what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, um, there's a lot of dismissal of it in a certain way as it being just like a political thing from the U.S. because the language that, you know, the CCP uses when it's not like mind-numbingly like scientific development, something, something, it's things like, oh, you know, we need more international cooperation or, you know, it sounds really good. Um, and it's, but like what they mean by those things isn't the same thing that it sounds like if you were to say it in a Western democracy or something like that. So it comes off kind of like, well, the U.S. is now inventing, uh, you know, the threat from uh, the China uh, China and calling it the Chinese Communist Party and things like that, um, because we need to, you know, we need to start another Cold War. We need to have an enemy. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so important that people not get their information about China solely from the Chinese propaganda services. Because, you know, for the past 40 years, people, especially in, in the media industry, have relied very heavily on the Global Times, which I, I know, Chris, you like a lot. It's my uh, favorite. I, I kind of do, too. I mean, they are very entertaining to watch. Uh, but, of course, they're, they're very hostile. Mm-hmm. And uh, But that's also true of, of Xinhua. It's also true of any university professor who gets interviewed by the New York Times, for example. That professor works for the Ministry of Education. Well, the Ministry of Education in China is not like the Department of Education in the United States of America or the Ministry of Education in England or Canada. The Ministry of Education in China is actually an extension of the propaganda department, the Chinese Communist Party propaganda department. And so any professor that you see is almost certainly a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, If he wasn't, he wouldn't be trusted to do interviews with uh, foreign media. And he is a spokesperson for the Chinese Communist Party, including for the, the propaganda organs and probably also Chinese uh, military intelligence. And so 
by quoting people like that, which I think many organizations have been prone to do, and by listening to people like that and collaborating with them, as many think tanks in Washington have done over the past 40 years, and co-authoring academic studies and publishing pieces together, it really does paint a very distorted picture of the Chinese Communist Party. It really presents them in the best light possible, when in fact, a much more honest and realistic interpretation of what they're really saying would require folks not to go to you know, those English language mouthpieces of the party, but to actually, again, watch the speeches of Xi Jinping, read what he writes in Chou Shi, the, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, leadership level, they're the most authoritative uh, journal where they write about their, their vision for the future and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And if you do that, and I think more and more people are starting to do that now, a very, very different image will emerge in your mind. And what you'll see is that I think the, the Trump administration has been right, at least recently. I think their initial their initial responses were, were a bit slow, um, but recently they, they've clearly started to pick up a lot of momentum and that they're trying to change our outdated China policy as fast as they can. Uh, and of course, it, it's not clear whether they'll be successful uh, at that or not. But I, in any event, I think it's very good that finally we have much more transparency from our leaders at the State Department, FBI, at all levels of, of government. Uh, we were talking about Mark Esper before, our Secretary of Defense. He came out with a piece in August of this year where he said the Pentagon is ready for China. And he talked about what what the Pentagon sees as, as China's military aims and what the Pentagon is doing so that when we get to the year 2030 or 2035, uh, we'll be much more prepared for meeting uh, the threats that, that are anticipated. And, I, and again, I think that that is that kind of public messaging, that kind of public education that we're starting to see is, is really, really positive and it's, it's needed uh, like never before. And I think there's a realization now in Washington that if the U.S. government doesn't start to talk honestly to the American people and to Congress about competition with the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Republic of China, if they continue to downplay it, if they're not honest about the fact that China now has a bigger Navy than we do and a bigger Coast Guard as well, and that they have way more missiles than we do of, of, of theater, theater missiles, so short, medium, intermediate range missiles, we have more ICBMs than they do, but they have way more theater missiles than we, we do, that we're actually looking at a future where we could lose a protracted great power war with China. And worse than that, we're losing deterrence. We're losing our overmatch, the, the overmatch that we have historically enjoyed at the conventional level of warfare and then at the nuclear level of warfare. Well, history shows that when you lose your overmatch and when your adversary can run war games and see that his probability of success, there's, it's, never a, it's never a black or white question. It's never a yes or no. Yes, we can win. No, we can't. It's always a probability. Right? It's, it's all about your gambling out because all war is a strategic gamble. And we've seen that. We saw that you know, in the, the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan, the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Who would have thought that they would have turned out the way they did? All war is a gamble. Well, if you know another country has hostile intentions and you know they're expansionistic by nature and that they want to take over territory, they want to conquer territory that, that they don't currently can control, and they've said that they've been very clear about that. They believe that territory belongs to them and always has since since you know ancient times. And in addition to that, you see them build up their military, and you know that the military balance is tipping in such a way where they could start to see advantages at any of those levels of war, whether it's the conventional level or the nuclear level. That is really scary, and I think that's one of the reasons why. You know, strategists, American strategists have started to look into the future. They don't like what they see. They're afraid that there could actually be a war with China. Um, and any war with China, whether we win it or not, any war with China is a strategic failure. 
that would be a nightmare. Even if you win, it's a nightmare. A great power war is, is literally the worst thing that human beings do. There's nothing else like it. In, in the entire history of our species, great power war is the worst. Millions and millions of people die. I mean, you look at World War II. Um, by some estimates, 90 million people died in World War II, and 2 billion people had their lives shattered by it. Uh, you can meet veterans who are now 96, 97. And I guarantee you, if you do, and if they were in battle in World War II, they're still going to have nightmares. They're still going to have nightmares to this day. And, and I, I've known people like that. That's what war does to people. It, it crushes them. They get depression afterwards. They, they have nightmares until their dying day. They, they turn to alcoholism. All kinds of families are shattered. It's really, really awful. And I think the World War II generation came out of that experience of Great Power War with a very sober mind. They realized that the, the number one objective of the United States government should be to make sure we never fight World War III. At the time, the threat, of course, was the Soviet Union. And there was a, a very real fear that we could end up fighting World War III with the Soviet Union. Now, today, the threat is the People's Republic of China. And it's a very real threat. And in some ways, it's probably going to be much more challenging to avoid war with China than it was to avoid war with the Soviet Union. And you think that's because the U.S. has allowed itself to lose its deterrence capability? Well, I think there's several factors at work. So one of the factors is there's just a complacency. Because we won the Cold War against the Soviet Union so easily and almost no cost at all to ourselves, I mean, there's no big battle. The Soviet Union just fell apart in 1991, and, and Russia just fell into our lap, and Eastern Europe just fell into our lap, and they started to become democracies, and they started to become some of our best friends in the world. I mean, you look at countries like Poland or the Czech Republic, which used to be uh, communist countries under the Soviet Empire. Today, these are shining success stories. Well, we earned that great victory at, at very little cost to ourselves. It came so easily, it convinced a lot of people, a lot of very, very important and influ influential people, that it was their destiny. It was destined that somehow this was a gift from God, that our way of life was so superior to authoritarianism, to communism, to socialism, that it was inevitable that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. Well, I can tell you, I don't think it was inevitable. If you look at the history of the Cold War, it was not inevitable at all. It could have gone in, in, many, in, in limitless other ways. We're very lucky it went in the way that it did. Uh, and one of the reasons it did go the way that it did was because for 40 years, we had people in positions of power in Washington who had been affected by World War II. And some of them were old enough, they had been affected by World War I as well. And they were scarred by it. And they were haunted by it. They were so afraid of another war like that. And so that fear made them vigilant. And it made them very proactive and very willing to spend political capital on things that they knew would be difficult for the American public to accept but that would be important in order to maintain strategic stability, in order to maintain uh, American overmatch, whether at the conventional level of war, which eventually we could no longer do, uh, and then at the nuclear level of war, which, again, we were, we were starting to fail at in the late 1970s, and then President Reagan turned that around in the 1980s. They were able to make these sacrifices. I don't think there are many people today in Washington or anywhere in our country who really believe a great power war is possible again, who really think in their heart of hearts that, we're, that we could possibly fight World War III with China, that China's actually going to invade Taiwan, that that's even possible because countries don't act that way anymore, they think, and that, that we might end up fighting this future war. I think there's this complacency there, and it's this combination of hubris that's, that's built up, I think very naturally, from our really easy victory in the first Cold War against the Soviet Union, that combined with just this complacency and this mirror imaging, this sense that everything's inevitable, that America is inevitably going to win. And that's caused people to make some very bad decisions 
uh, in the past. I mean, our entire relationship with the People's Republic of China was based on these myths uh, that that everything was inevitable. And it was inevitably going to go our way as long as we engaged China that we could transform them. Well, now what we've seen after this 40 year, actually 41 year of relationship with the PRC is that no, we haven't changed them for the better. We've actually changed them for the worse. We've made them much more powerful. We've made them capable of committing Nazi-like ethnic cleansing in Xinjiang and elsewhere in China that our technology companies have provided them with the, the, the systems that they need, the command and control systems, the communication systems, the, the video, uh, video camera systems, and then the, the artificial intelligence capabilities that they need to conduct you know, their campaign, the, the concentration camps, and their really Orwellian mass surveillance campaign all across, all across China. And now that's spreading. And uh, to your earlier point about how it's so difficult for, for China Uncensored to actually get merchandise, well, one of the reasons that's happened, as you guys know, is because our country has been influenced uh, and infiltrated by the Chinese Communist Party. And so now anybody who holds a view that's different uh, or unwelcome by Beijing has a really tough time doing anything. And so what that means is we've not changed China, except for the worse, and China has changed us for the worse, that, that our country's become dependent on the Chinese market. We've become dependent on uh, the goodwill and the cooperation of the Chinese Communist Party uh, at all levels. Our education system, our universities are, are dependent on their tuition money. Many of our, our major media companies are dependent on cooperation and the Chinese market. And, and of course, the list goes on and on, so I won't belabor the point, uh, but this is a serious problem. And the reason this problem happened, I think, is, is that combination of hubris and then disbelief in the face of, of the facts. Uh, and they're very unpleasant facts. They're very unfavorable. It's natural that we should try to deny them, but I think we're, we're, we would be fools to do that. Well, so here's my question about that. You've got all these people who think, oh, you know, America and China couldn't possibly have this great power war. And yet these are the same people that are saying we shouldn't antagonize China by supporting Taiwan because then there will be consequences. But if they don't believe that the consequence could be a war, then like, what are they concerned about? Like, why can't we just make Taiwan an official ally? Well, again, I think it's, it's, they're, you're right. Matt, there is this schizophrenia in the, the China watching community that has built up. And it's only natural because I can tell you, having spent a little bit of time in the PRC and having met quite a few Chinese government officials and, and Chinese military officers uh, in, in my past jobs, that they are crazy or, or they'll drive <laughs> you crazy. You know, they're actually very rational uh, in their own way. And they're very good at what they do. They're very professional. Uh, in many ways, but also they're very ideological as well. Uh, but they will drive you crazy. There's no question about that. Uh, and in fact, they're trying to drive you crazy. They're, they're trying to get inside your head. Uh, they they kind of want to win your heart over. But at the end of the day, what they really want is to get inside the heads of Americans and to convince them that the only future uh, that could possibly be okay for us is a future in which we do virtually whatever Beijing wants us to do. Uh, and there's a combination of positive incentives that they use to do that. So a lot of money, for example, and then there's a lot of negative incentives that they, they so for example, denying really great investigative journalists like you guys, the ability to, to, to make a decent living because you can't sell your merchandise. No one will cooperate with you. YouTube will drop your shows or they'll, They'll, they'll alter uh, you know, your ability to monetize shows. Uh, that, that goes on to university professors, where it's very difficult to get tenure. Uh, you don't toe the line. That goes on with uh, news organizations, where your editor won't publish your piece, or he'll throw up obstacles if, if you're too political of the CCP. And, and it just goes on and on. And so I think that's why your program is so incredibly important. You guys provide this wonderful public service and it takes a lot of courage to do it. Uh, it forces you to make a lot of sacrifices, I'm sure. Uh, 
Um, but it's really important for the future of our, of our country's freedom and democracy that folks do point out the facts as best as we can understand them. And you guys are very good at that. I really appreciate that, Ian. Um, it, this really is another Cold War where once again, what is on the line is whether the world continues under liberal democracy or China's authoritarian communist model. And there's a bunch of fronts to this war. Hong Kong was a front. We've kind of lost that war. Taiwan seems to be another front in this war. Is an actual war with communist China inevitable at this point? No. No, nothing's inevitable. I mean, that's that's why policymaking is so important. That's why American leadership is so important is because we have it within our power, the ability to shape the future. It doesn't mean we can control the future, but we can shape it. We can influence it. Any any American who has a voice can can use it and they can help contribute to the consensus that, that we need to build in our country. Uh, and with our allies, other democratic countries around the world, that today we're facing a strategic competitor like we've never faced before. That in many ways, the first Cold War, the Cold War that we fought with the Soviet Union, may prove to be much easier than the second Cold War, the, sec the Cold War that we're fighting with the People's Republic of China. That just like World War I, at the time it was so shocking, and no one could imagine, they called it the Great War, they didn't call it World War I. No one could imagine there would be a World War II. And no one certainly imagined that World War II would be so much worse as it was than World War I. Uh, it could be the case, and this is just, I'm just speculating here because, of course, no one knows what the future will bring. But it could be the case that this strategic competition with the PRC, this new Cold War, this Cold War II, um, as you've called it, and I think right, rightfully so, this could be much more difficult and much more dangerous. And there's no guarantee that we're going to win. And we're certainly not going to win if we don't treat it seriously and we don't give it the, the intellectual capital that it deserves, if we don't uh, invest heavily in public education. Because what will happen ultimately is if U.S. government is not transparent with the American people, then universities will continue to self-censor. Media will continue to self-censor. Organizations like the NBA will continue to self-censor. Hollywood will continue to self-censor as they do and as we've seen uh, increasingly over recent years. And eventually Americans will become actually convinced, they'll, they'll become brainwashed by the Chinese Communist Party because that will be the only voice that they hear or at least the main voice that they hear. And that voice will, will drown out all other voices. Uh, that's the future that that we possibly face. And I think that's Again, why it's so important that the current uh, administration is being much more honest with the American people. And I hope, uh, whatever the results of, of our elections, I hope that the future uh, administration will be at least as honest, uh, if not more honest, because I think, again, there, there's a lot of room for improving our policy. Well, I mean, I'm glad that it doesn't seem too late to turn things around, but it doesn't seem like something that the U.S. government can do just by itself, just by being transparent. No, you're right. It, it's not. It will take a whole of society effort. And one of the great things about our country, and this is true of all democracies, is that's possible. If the if the government is transparent, if it protects people for example, from China's predatory uh, economic policies, if it shines a light and if it allows this open debate uh, to happen, which open societies like ours have traditionally been very, very good at, people will then naturally start to support the government's policy, not because, uh, you know, in many cases, they might not even be very patriotic or, or very nationalistic. You know, they could be globalists um, who see themselves as, as uh, citizens of the world but that won't matter because the more you learn about the Chinese Communist Party, the more you realize how incredibly ugly and dangerous that regime is. But again, people won't learn. They won't have the opportunity to get the information that they need so they can make up their own minds uh, if 
if the U.S. government doesn't doesn't protect them and doesn't allow that to happen, that if we continue to, you know, the the past policies of engagement and collaboration and cooperation with the Chinese Communist Party, which was our default setting from President Reagan, well, really President Carter through Reagan all the way up to President Obama, that was our default setting uh, in this country, was that no matter what China did, we were going to cooperate with them, we were going to collaborate with them, that we were going to minimize co competition, we were going to minimize any friction in the relationship that that was our policy. If we continue that, or if we go back to that, now that we've started competing with them, if we go back to that, we're in big trouble because that, that will give a green light, again, to universities, to media, to corporations all across our country, to everybody to, to self-censor and to, to comport themselves in a way that pleases uh, or at least adheres to the Chinese Communist Party. And that would be very dangerous. And so, uh, you know, Secretary of State um, Mike Pompeo recently said that his number one priority was not to focus on allies. His number one priority was to make an alliance with the American people. And then once we do that, once we have our own house in order, once the American people are awake and alive to the dangers that, that we face in this country, then we can we can present a united front to our allies. Right now, we don't have that. There are a lot of different voices. There's no consensus, I don't think, I don't see it. There's no consensus about uh, our China policy and whether or not it's really a threat and whether or not there could actually be a war with China and whether or not we, we should actually do anything different with Taiwan. I don't think there's a consensus there. I think there's this debate that's going on. And, uh, and so I, I personally, I thought it was very smart for the Secretary of State to say that one of the reasons he and other government leaders are being so vocal and making all these public speeches about, about, about China and specifically about the Chinese Communist Party, of course, not the people of China, not Chinese culture, not Chinese civilization. You know, our, our beef is entirely with this totalitarian political organization, uh, and that's it. Uh, I think the reason he's doing that, you know, according to his own words, is because without the support of the American public, there's no way the U.S. government on its own can possibly keep this country safe and can possibly deal with a threat like the one we face from the CCP. Because the PRC, unlike the Soviet Union, you know, the Soviet Union was a military threat. They had a very impressive military. The PRC also is a military threat, and they have a very impressive military, but they're also an economic threat. They're a technological threat. They're able to infiltrate Hollywood. They're able to infiltrate uh, Silicon Valley and Wall Street. That was never possible for the Soviet Union. Um, that, that would have never been acceptable for people. Back during the Cold War, people viewed the Russians, certainly the, the state, the Russian state, the Chinese Communist, or excuse me, the Russian Communist Party, they viewed them about the, the same way that most people view uh, neo-Nazis, KKK, um, you know, serial killers. <laughs> People just felt this 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 profound disgust, and they viewed them as really adversarial and really anti-American. Americans today don't feel that way. Mo not most Americans, anyways. I don't think feel that way about about China's government. There, so there's not this knee-jerk reaction. There's not this disgust from people. If you tell them, oh, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a research project with a university or a think tank in China, or, oh, my, my hedge fund is investing heavily in Chinese companies, which are actually an arm of the Chinese military or an arm of, of Chinese intelligence or state-owned enterprises, uh, or if you're a Hollywood director or producer and you say, oh, yeah, my next major film is going to star several actors from China who are all members of the Chinese Communist Party, and they all work for the propaganda department. Uh, and we're going to make a killing. It's going to be great. We're going to we're going to fill a lot of seats in in that giant market over in China. Th there's not this reflexive disgust that you would hope for from people when those conversations go on. And I think, again, the more people understand, I'm convinced, anyways, that the better equipped they'll be with information to make up their own minds. And when they do, I think. You know, I think 10 years from now, maybe not that long, people will start to see the CCP with this 
reflexive disgust that we have uh, towards other really authoritarian, really oppressive anti-American groups. Well, so the good news, I think, is at least it seems like it is changing in this country because, you know, the NBA and their relationship with uh, China and Xinjiang, that's getting called out more and more. Disney was uh, run over the rakes because of uh, Mulan and Xinjiang as well. So I think uh, we are getting a little bit of uh, people are beginning to associate China with some pretty bad things. Uh, So thank you again for joining us. Uh, It's always a pleasure to have you on. I, I'm not sure if that's the right feeling I have, but uh, it's always it's always great to hear from you. Likewise. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. But yeah, I'm really not sure whether to feel optimistic or pessimistic after that. Because, yeah, on the one hand, people are beginning to talk about China in a different way. But the infiltration has been so deep and severe. I feel terrible. Like, I just feel so depressed now. It just feels like such a hard thing to overcome. Like, there's so much happening, you know, with things like Hong Kong or with the Chinese Communist Party, you know, flying warplanes over Taiwan and things like that. It just... And then, yeah, I'm I'm just depressed. I'm actually really optimistic because... This is character revealing. Well, look, if... China's the Chinese Communist Party is telling us they're going to go to war and, and overtake Taiwan. Then we know we have to do something, and we're going to start to do it. Are uh, we? Well, that, I'm optimistic that okay. we are right, and that like we've already seen things changing. You know, at some point, uh, Trump is going to tweet at 3 a.m. Taiwan is a great country, and then he'll have said the c word, and then we'll have to actually make this happen. Trump's already said the c word. Oh, oh. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I really think you know we've got to grab Taiwan by the diplomacy here oh, and God. really and really make this relationship work. And I think that the Trump administration is doing it. And even if we get a Biden administration, uh, there's enough pressure that you know we're already starting to move in the right direction. I don't know. I just maybe this is because I just read an article about how lobbyists are already trying to convince the Biden transition team that there should be a reset with China, uh, get back oh. to engagement. So you know, to business reasons. So that's really depressing to to read that. Well, you know? With any luck, um, Biden has already forgotten that they said that. Too. Well, I mean, I have to say I am kind of optimistic, too. I mean, the way you see people talking about things like Xinjiang, things like Hong Kong, I don't think it can go back to just kind of like, oh, China, that's the that's the land of mist and dragons. Well, whatever. I don't know. I mean, I think that there definitely it's good that people are talking about um, the Uyghurs. I'm also on Twitter more than you guys. So I see all of the Uyghur genocide denial oh, going on on Twitter, um, you know. So it's very like there are people still really trying to have the argument that it's not happening. Wow. Yeah, like very much so that it is, you know, like a Western. I mean, they're still denying organ harvesting, even though facts. Well, I mean, I think that's much less well known than the Uyghur situation, the the organ harvesting part. But I, I guess I don't underestimate the possibility that it could just all go back to the way it was, you know. Five years ago. Well, I'm sorry, Shelley, but Matt said he's optimistic. I said I'm optimistic, so you're outvoted. Optimism is the way. Your pessimism is wrong. That's how it works, right? In a democracy, not in an authoritarian system where Shelley's That's in charge. That's not even how it works in a democracy. <laughs> how does it work in a democracy? No, in a democracy, we, we all fight each other over different ideologies. Uh, Okay, so I'm optimistic with a touch of pessimism. You're optimistic and you're pessimistic. I'm not totally pessimistic, but I think that, well, I guess it's like what Ian was saying about the complacency, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that this is the time to get complacent about it because it could go so easily back to, like, we should be partners with China. Cooperation. Who doesn't like cooperation? Yeah, I mean, just because it seems like there is more awareness now than there was. And that's definitely true. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean that, like, you know, we couldn't just all start getting um, pulled in by, like, all the domestic problems we have in the U.S. or we don't care about 
um, China anymore. Because, like, there's so many things that could happen. The genie can be shoved back in the bottle, despite what they say. Well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. And I really appreciate what Ian said about our show. I don't, like, I do feel that. Like, we have been, for like eight years, kind of crying out in the dark. Like, hey, everyone, you need to pay attention to China. It's important. And hopefully people are beginning to pay attention. Can't wait to get that 100,000 subscriber plaque, and then we'll know that people are paying attention. It's not the whether or not Taiwan is invaded. It's if we get that 100,000 subscriber plaque. Right. That's what I said. It's about the plaque. It's about the plaque. (laughs) Oh, my God. And on that note, I will also be interviewing Ian on an upcoming episode of China Uncensored, so be sure to check that out if there are any of you watching this podcast that don't know We have a China Uncensored. I'm pretty sure it's the other way around. Probably. Anyways, be sure to check that out. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chong. And I'm Matt Ganesda. We'll talk to you next time.